Hi, I'm Ulf Riebesel. Imagine you're sick with a headache or a stomach ache. For many of us, the first reaction probably is to take an aspirin. It may kill the pain, but of course it doesn't cure the problem. As we come to grips that our planet's climate system is getting out of balance due to human activities, it may seem like a logical reaction to us to also look for a quick fix for this problem. But keep in mind, there's usually a list of risks and possible side effects associated with any medicine. We know about these because of long-term studies with a large number of patients. Risks and undesirable side effects are likely to also be associated with any climate intervention measure except that for our climate system, we will not be able to do an extensive study on this because there's only one patient Earth. But let's take a closer look at this. This graph summarizes the geoengineering options presently under discussion. There are basically two types of options, one relying on solar radiation management, which means reducing the incoming sunlight by various means of shading. None of these options reduces the atmospheric CO2 concentration, so they do not help to mitigate ocean acidification. The other type of geoengineering measures aims at carbon dioxide removal. This can be done by technical means, which however has a considerable carbon footprint itself. The captured CO2 must then be stored somewhere, for example, in geological formations, on land or below the sea floor. The risk of leakage from these reservoirs is, of course, a critical issue. The other option for carbon removal is to let nature do the job through photosynthesis, either on land by afforestation or in the ocean by enhancing algal growth. The best studied measure of CO2 removal in the ocean is the fertilization of plankton productivity through iron addition. This graph shows the locations where field experiments on iron fertilization have been conducted so far. Most of them are in areas where iron limitation precludes the efficient utilization of the major nutrients. As a result of this, productivity in these areas is low. Adding iron into the surface layer of these regions stimulates the growth of microalgae. The satellite image shown here has become kind of an icon for research on iron fertilization. It was taken a few weeks after the Soiree experiment, which was conducted in the Southern Ocean in 1999. It shows the chlorophyll concentration, an indicator for phytoplankton biomass, in the area fertilized during the Soiree experiment. It's taken as evidence that iron fertilization can in fact generate a temporal increase in phytoplankton biomass. The desired sequence of responses after iron fertilization are shown in this sketch. Enhanced algal growth leads to more CO2 fixation into biomass. Part of this biomass sinks out to deeper layers and carries the fixed carbon with it. On the way down, the organic matter is remineralized by bacteria and the fixed carbon is released again as CO2. The portion that sinks below the winter mixed layer will stay out of contact with the atmosphere for decades to centuries. This is the part that we call sequestered CO2. The efficiency of this approach is still uncertain. Its capacity is low to moderate compared to the present CO2 emissions from fossil fuel burning. So even if huge areas of the ocean are continuously fertilized with iron, and provided that a substantial part of the stimulated production really ends up in the deep sea, it would still only make a small contribution to solving the greenhouse problem. And it involves the risk of some possible side effects. Large-scale iron fertilization would deplete deep ocean oxygen and increase deep water acidification. And it may reduce the productivity downstream in other parts of the ocean. 
on the positive side, once implemented, it can be stopped any time without any lasting impact because the added iron will disappear from the water column within weeks. The second option is what scientists refer to as artificial upwelling. The idea builds on the fact that large parts of the ocean are like ocean deserts, except that not water is limiting growth, but the lack of nutrients. However, just a couple of hundred meters below the nutrient-poor surface layer, the waters are rich in essential nutrients. Mixing of the water column in these areas is not strong enough to bring those nutrient-rich deep waters to the sunlit surface layer. So all it takes to boost productivity in these ocean deserts is to draw the deep water into the surface layer. Some scientists have suggested doing this with wave pumps, long tubes in which deep water is pumped to the surface using wave energy. This way the pumping would be carbon neutral. The weakness of this approach for the purpose of CO2 sequestration is that the deep water is not only enriched in nutrients, it is also rich in CO2. So the initial effect of artificial upwelling is that CO2 is transported upwards rather than downwards, as intended. Only if the phytoplankton use the upwelled nutrients to fix more CO2 than was transported upwards will this approach generate a positive CO2 drawdown. And even then, the benefit for CO2 sequestration will likely be small. On the other hand, as artificial upwelling increases ocean productivity, this might lead to enhanced fish production. The benefits of this are likely to be much higher than applying artificial upwelling for CO2 sequestration. Because the approach has not been tested so far, it's difficult to judge on possible side effects at this point in time. The third option involves dumping lime into the ocean. As the lime dissolves and reacts with water, it makes seawater more alkaline, so it would in fact revert ocean acidification. It would also increase the ocean's capacity to take up atmospheric CO2. Reverting ocean acidification and increasing oceanic CO2 uptake? Way to go, you may think. But the amount of lime needed for making any difference is just enormous. For a given amount of CO2 to be sequestered, you would need about twice the amount of lime. In other words, to make a difference under today's CO2 emissions, you need to grind down and process mountains of limestone, such as the dolomites shown in this picture. The costs for mining, processing, transporting, and distributing the lime are so high that the approach wouldn't be economically viable certainly not as a CO2 removal mechanism. It may still be useful for local mitigation of ocean acidification, for example, in endangered high-value ecosystems, such as coral reefs. But to date, there are no studies on potential environmental risks and side effects, so it's hard to judge how useful alkalization, the addition of calcium carbonate in the ocean, lime, is in helping marine life to cope with ocean acidification. The take-home message from this chapter, there is no quick fix for the climate change problem in the ocean. And let's be honest, the word geoengineering itself is misleading. For most people, engineering implies that something is understood very well, done with great precision, and in a predictable manner. Well, none of these qualities really apply to the type of measures we have discussed here. So a more appropriate term for these global scale manipulations might be climate intervention. Whatever we call it, we are presently unable to make reliable predictions on the environmental risks and side effects associated with most of these measures. So, fingers off, right? Well, 
imagine if progress on reducing CO2 emissions is remaining slow and the impacts of climate change become more severe, the pressure for alternative measures will build up. Should that situation occur, it would be important to have a more solid understanding of the efficiency and capacity of possible climate intervention measures, and even more important, about the associated environmental risks. I therefore believe that we as scientists have a responsibility to further explore possible climate engineering approaches, whether we would like to see them implemented or not. What do you think?